Hi, everybody. Yeah! Good, good. Is anybody tired? I'm tired, but I'm happy to be here. Yes, team tired. Uh, welcome to our panel. Community leaders tell all everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask. As you can see in the title, this is a conversation. It's not just a monologue. Um, so feel free at any time, as Lisa mentioned, you can tag us on Twitter. You can put up your hand. I will have a microphone. I will run over to you. Uh, shout out to the folks in the universe that are online joining us today. Um, anyway, just a couple of ground rules before we get started is uh, for the folks that are online, uh, closed captioning, um, as with all the, the talks here in KubeCon. In terms of the Q&A, uh, the, the easiest for us will probably be just centralizing things on Twitter, um, but as well, if you want to follow up on Slack, tag us um, in the, uh, the channel KubeCon sessions, all right? And, and like I said, we can, we can continue the conversation there. We can also continue the conversation in the hallway. Uh, we'll be around for the rest of the day. And if you really, really behave, does anybody know Dominique, who's sitting right here in the second row? Um, you may know her. Does anybody that knows her knows that she sings really well? <laughs> Dominique is an amazing singer and musician and DJ. And she has kindly volunteered that if everybody behaves well, if we get minimum seven questions from the audience, that she will sing a song with me. And I will play the ukulele, which I have over here in my bag. Um, so, like I said, you have a good incentive to participate, all right? Um, anyway, that being said, folks that we have with us today, we've got Kim, we've got Lisa, we've got Sharon. I'll have each, uh, each of them introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll jump right into the conversation, all right? Before we do that, though, we just kind of want to pull the audience. How many of you have a community or work in community? Okay. In terms of, in terms of the different kinds of communities, um, are we talking about a product-based community any, in any cases, all right? Are we, in some cases, perhaps a community of practice, of practitioners sharing knowledge, all right? And then open source, open source, cool, 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 good. So we got a different mixture. Um, that's nice in, in terms of our backgrounds and profiles as well. You'll also see a fair amount of uh, different experiences. That being said, uh, oh, and of course, code of conduct, respect the code of conduct, or you'll get kicked out and you will not be able to listen to Dominique sing. Um, so don't do that. I think. Yeah, yeah, very quietly, yeah. Um, good, and also want to mention this so that I don't forget, uh, we had the pleasure of being on the Cloud Unfiltered uh, podcast, and you'll be able to check that out in about a month, um, having a conversation about some of the things that we talked about today. It went so quickly that we're going to be organizing another session to continue the conversation, as well as the things, the, the learnings that we will um, be extracting from, from today's panel. That being said, sorry. That being said, let's turn it over to Lisa. Can you just introduce yourself? Tell us your community story in about one minute. Go for it. Sure. Hi, and and hi. Obviously, if you don't know Dominique, you might know DevOps Tommy, and that's how I knew you. And this is the first time we've met in person, so it's incredible to meet so many community folks in real life for the first time in years. Um, I'm Lisa Marie Nampy. Community knows me as Lisa. I, by day, work for Cockroach Labs. I organize cloud native containers in the San Francisco Bay Area, which started out as the first OpenStack community, then became one of the largest CNCF open source communities. And um, and we talk about mostly end user stories and all kinds of you know showcasing some really awesome talent that's in the community. Um, and uh, but by day, I run developer relations at Cockroach Labs. Oh. Hi, Sharon Zitzman. Um, I run my own company called RTFM, please. Yes, read the manual. Um, <laughs> where I do developer relations as a service, but not as part of my day job. I do run a couple of communities out of Tel Aviv, the DevOps community in Israel, and the cloud native and open source communities in Israel that have been running for more than 10 years, both of them. Uh, one of them started as the OpenStack community and c pivoted into a wider scope of things. Uh, and yeah, and I had the pleasure of meeting a lot of the community folks in the room here through the community work. And I think that community can take you from local to global if you do the things right. Oh, we are on. Hi. I'm Kim McMahon. Uh, right now I'm at Cisco. I've been there for a couple months and I was brought in to help build out our open source marketing. Um, uh, although I, when I do write marketing in my, in my plan, I do asterisk it and put an ex a disclaimer down at the bottom of that, just FYI, if you ever want to try to educate your leadership on that, but as well as build community from our open source projects into our products. So it's kind of a, a little unique role. And some of you may know me from my time at Cloud Native Computing Foundation, where I did the marketing and community. I see a few nods there. So hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Nice round of introductions. I'll actually leave this one. Okay. So 
first question. I feel like we're in a, in a game show. So first question, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that um, was very overwhelming for me when I got started out in community was what was I actually being asked to do, right? It sounds like pretty crazy, right? But what are the expectations and how can we, how can we measure them, right? Very often, we talk about things like engagement, metrics, et cetera. A lot, of, a lot of folks are going through that right now in KubeCon. Badge scans are one metric, but what does that really mean in terms of meaningful conversations, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of communities, starting out from the beginning, talking about goals and thinking about the metrics that are associated with them. I like each one of our panelists to talk about that a little bit. Kim, you can go, you can, you go first on talking about goals and also how those are linked to metrics. Perhaps some of the metrics that maybe are overlooked the process of establishing goals. What's your experience been like with that? <laughs> this is kind of like when you asked me that question about CNCF yesterday. <laughs> um, I, I feel a little bit on the spot. So uh, without telling too many tales, um, we, we don't really have a community. I'm in the Emerging Technologies group, and you probably have seen Cisco here for a long time. And yes, we do open source. But um, we didn't, we did, they brought me in specifically to do this. They talked with me and were like, oh, we must have her. So I, what I didn't have coming in, I had a grand plan of what you should do when you build a community, but what I didn't have is what our organization was trying to accomplish as we're building that community. So it, for me, it's been iterative. So I look at, uh, here, here's some metrics and here's some plans that we can do that make sense for community growth. Um, but then it goes back into leadership and they're like, no, we don't want to do that or no, we want to focus on this. And my plan has been very fluid for the, the three and a half months I've been there. So, um, so I use some of the very typical metrics. Um, yes, I do count GitHub stars. Don't hate me for it, but it does, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a vanity metric, but you know, it helps, it, it shows awareness. I split my metrics into five categories, awareness, activation, sign up for, you know, sign up for a download, adoption, you're using the product, um, forgot, and then retention. Forgot the last one there. Um, oh, I think it's an engagement metric. Like, are you talking with the community? Have we identified those community leaders? So if you kind of break it up, I broke it down into what our marketing, kind of what our marketing pillars are for the organization, and then looked for different metrics like the stars, like the number of people joining the Slack community. And I'm gonna give a big shout out to D-A-U-M-A-U, right? Um, it's, it's a metric that I, I learned from working with Jono, daily active users over monthly active users, to look at what the health of the community is and out of my whole 1,700 Slack people, you know, how many of them are actually contributing? So um, there's, a lot of things you can do, but really try to break it down uh, and as to something that is achievable. So you keep your job. It's Amazing. good to keep your job. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Great answer. Um, so I think that you really need to be very uh, conscious of the type of community that you're building. And so you asked questions like, what is the focus of your community? Is it a product community? Is it a practitioner community? Is it an open source community? And this will define the different metrics that you actually uh, are, are qualifying, right? Uh, a good friend, Amir Shavat, who uh, was the head of developer relations at Slack for a very long time and started his own company that was acquired by Twitter, um, said it took them a very, very long time at Slack to understand that the metric that they were optimizing for was um, daily active tokens for them um, it, when they wanted to build kind of out, out their platform and have more in API integration. So it, I don't think there's a one um, size fits all for every community. Uh, I think depending on the type of community you're building, if it's a practitioner community, the, it doesn't quantify itself in numbers, it quantifies itself in the amount of people that derive value from your community, and that can be 10 people, and that can be 50 people, and that can be 1,000 people. If you have uh, a, a certain core of people that are coming out every single time you have an event or a meetup or a conversation and they wanna be actively involved, that can be very, very meaningful. So it just really depends on what um, you're optimizing for. If it's a business and product focused community, it can be adoption, it can be upsell, it can be success with your product. If it's a practitioner community, it's the value that people are deriving from the community. In the, dev in the DevOps days community, we call that the law of mobility. If people are choosing to come and be an active part of your community, that's meaningful. Um, so it really depends on what you're optimizing for. Respect, good answer, solid, strong, Lisa. 
Oh, our answers are being <laughs> voted on. Okay. Uh, the other metric it was uh, I was just going to see how long it took one of us to mention Jono's name. He's been a mentor for all of us, and that was about what a minute and a half. We were going to turn it into a drinking game for how many times it was mentioned, but <laughs> we would be drunk. So um, thank you to all of our mentors who have, who have helped us get to be able to create and build these incredible communities. Um, they've said most of what I would have said. The one thing I will also caution. Uh, is when you are asked to build a community, because once you put developer advocate or technical evangelist or community architect on your LinkedIn page, you will get hit on by no less than 15 recruiters a day because every company all of a sudden has decided they need a developer relations department, they need a whole bunch of developer advocates, like no matter what type of company it is, everybody needs this. And I'm sure you've all experienced this. And what I always say, and those recruiters, by the way, will have no idea of what type of community they're trying to build, what type of person would really be good for that, if it's going to be a good fit, because we all know the pain of it not being a good fit. It's pain for everybody involved. So one of the things that I always ask the recruiters just to kind of generally make them go away, but also um, ask the companies is, why are you building this team? Why do you think you need developer relations? Why do you think you need developer advocates? What are you trying to do? And a lot of times they don't know why. You know, this thing was started by what? Guy Kawasaki at Apple what, 16 years ago or something. It didn't even exist until recently. And you could ask 20 developer advocates what they do and what they should do and you'll get 20 different answers, right? So it's still being figured out. And so getting that definition up front and setting those expectations will make your jobs so much easier. And especially when you're at a corporation, because, okay, we're doing this in open source communities. That's actually the easiest, uh, trust me. Uh, that's, you know, you've got an enthusiastic community that wants to come, wants to contribute, wants to do stuff upstream. And we can talk about all the ways you can get involved in open source communities. But when you're doing this for a corporation and you're, in theory, being paid to do it, um, which I've only started doing <laughs> recently, most of my life I was doing this not getting paid to do it. But recently I have been put in that position where you're, you know, win the hearts and minds of every developer. Like how many times have we heard that, right? What does that even mean? Every developer, right? Like that doesn't exist. So you really have to ask about 15 more questions after that and define what your goals are, what you're trying to achieve, and then you can figure out how to measure that. And there are tools out there. There's some great tools. A lot more exist today than that used to exist. Um, but first, make sure you set that expectation. That's great. Oh, we've already got a question. And so that's very great advice because I used to work for a company that were very much like, oh, awesome, we need DevRel, we need some community management, please come and help us. Uh, and I forgot to ask these questions and then found out um, like after six months or something what the person left and then I was left with having to deal with a lot of, um, well, C-level uh, people were like, why, why, why what are you, what's, what, what are you doing here? So my question to you is, if, if anyone in, 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 in the panel has experienced this before, if you have joined this company and then all of a sudden they, they change the goalpost, because that's, I've seen that in the, in the, in the market recently where uh, DevRel and that kind of stuff is first, the first thing to be slashed uh, if something changed uh, in, in uh, you know, in um, having to have a reduction in force or something like that. How do you deal with, or have you dealt with, uh, leadership change in the goalpost if they are, uh, you know? Yeah. Take I, I'm happy to take that first. Um, I'm actually going to take it uh, from the perspective of being a freelancer and running my own company, and I've experienced that vis-a-vis uh, -vis many customers. Before uh, before I was a freelancer, I was actually, uh, you know, uh, higher, I was at different companies. I was the head of user communities at Sneak, before that at AppsFlyer, before that at Cloudify. Um, but a lot of the things that I've learned in that respect is that um, you have to be you have to be very deterministic about the things that are in scope and out of scope and you have to be able to communicate that very very well uh, and that's kind of how I work with my clients as well I say to them these are the things that I do as developer relations as a service I'm not a developer relations for hire for example like I'm not gonna be the face of your company and you know promoting your work I'm kind of on the back end and doing uh, a lot of work and execution but you have to be very very um, explicit about the things that you're going to be doing and the things that you're not going to be doing and how you know how to, and then you reverse engineer how you measure success. And if we spoke about the previous uh, question, which was like, what are the metrics for success? You can say, okay, if these are the goals that we want to achieve, these are the tactical things that we need to do. These are the str strategic things we need to do. And these are the things that are in the scope of what I know how to do. Anything that's out of this scope, we can outsource. We can work with other, um, you know, 
people that have the skill set to do these things. Um, but you, you need to be able to know what those things are and define them very, very well because then you're gonna set those expectations. And the goalpost does move, it does move a lot. And then they'll say to you, oh, but that's not what we wanna do. And you say to them, okay, so tell me within the, the scope of these skills that I have, what we wanna achieve. Um, and so that, that's true also when you're working as a freelancer with clients and you have 10 bosses and it's true when you're also, um, you know, in a company and trying to define expectations. I think it's a very rare company that understands the value of community. Very rare, right? And we know who they are because a lot of them are here. So it feels like, oh yeah, that, but it's very rare. And especially when you go into smaller companies and there's roles like developer advocates, technical evangelists that people don't really know what we do. It's hard to measure. So it's hard to, you know, really have that slide of your impact. Um, it's like, it's getting easier, but it, it has been incredibly difficult. The goalposts move all the time. It's like shaking, you know, so aligning your goals to the goals of the company, if you're getting paid to do this, um, and then if that leadership changes, that's your first phone call. And you know, making sure that your goals are still, you know, figuring out what the new goals of the company are, and then creatively figuring out how you're aligning your goals to that, because you need funding for these programs. Mm -hmm. And so you're just gonna have to stay on top of that if you're doing this inside a company. And you know you have unrealistic expectations coming at you, or you have expectations of you to be part of a sales force, which is definitely not what our jobs are. So, you know, setting the expectations of this is what I am doing, this is what I'm not doing, um, and showing them how it's aligned to the, the company goals and metrics as those change. And I think, and I think that's what, you know, Kim was sort of reflecting in the beginning. Like, there, if you can't make some kind of a case around business value, you know, regardless of the goalpost and the changing figures in leadership, you're probably gonna get pretty uncomfortable pretty quickly. Um, because, so what are you doing here? And then on, you add to that the lack of understanding about what community is, because like, oh, so you do social media. It's like, no, I mean, there's so much more. And, but, it, but I don't blame people for saying that because there's, it's still something that's, it's, you know, uh, the maturity level you know, varies a lot depending on the experience in the organization. Kim, did you want to add something? No, I think, uh, no, everybody covered it. Great. Good. Did you get your question answered? Okay. Yeah, good. I just want to add one tiny thing, and I think that, um, that this is true for any role. And I think that a lot of roles are undergoing this transition of understanding how um, your role brings benefit to the business. And this is true also for engineering. A lot of times engineering, we're sitting in like the basement writing their code and they didn't understand what features they're rolling out, what value it brings to the end customer. And we're seeing that very, that it's very tightly coupled with the uh, business's success today to understand why you're here and why it's strategic to the company. And you need to be able to, to know that inside and out. If they wake you up in the middle of the night, you have the answer to that question. Why is my role strategic to this company? in any role. Okay, next up I wanna ask, um, in, in working in community, one of the things that I learned later on um, is you're gonna have to deal with conflict resolution. There are going to be conflicts. There are gonna be disagreements. There are going to be moments where uh, egos can get involved, things of that nature. Taking a step back, the importance of empathy as, as part of you know, building inclusive communities, I'd like to know your experiences, any stories you'd like to share about moments where um, of dealing with those conflicts and on top of it, establishing empathy from the very beginning. We have people from different countries. Um, how many of you, how many of you uh, English is your first language? All right, so we got about less than half. Um, so with that in mind as well too, sometimes someone might say something that uh, translating directly could be taken as being offensive all those different kinds of things. How can people that work in community build that additional empathy to be able to, like I said, be more welcoming and make sure that, that everyone is being uh, protected? Who wants to go first? Well, I'll go ahead and I'll take the corporate side here. And um, so my empathy is around my coworkers uh, who, uh, I'm, kind of, I'm in the engineering organization, so many of them are engineers and uh, so I had a, a recent situation, and he'll watch this video and thank me for it on WebEx messaging later, I'm sure. But um, I, we had a situation that, that this individual did not agree with, the with what I wanted to do with the plan, with the community plan. Uh, just one individual. And we went back and forth for three weeks, and, and I kept trying to explain to him, this is why we need to do this. It's Yes, it's not perfect. No, it's not the perfect open source community, but this is as good as it gets in this kind of time frame. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, he, he went above my head and, and killed it. And so now I am backing up 
and I am putting together a six page plan of what we're going to do and I'm going to make sure that I get my SVP approval and so that if I have somebody who doesn't agree with what I want to do from community I have it explained why I'm taking these steps why I think we need to do this platform or that platform or go to that event and and then I also have approval so it was really important to help him make him feel like he had buy-in but at the end of the day when I didn't have approval he was able to, to stop it. So you get that buy-in with these conversations, and then you make sure that you document and get your, your senior leadership approval. So that's the corporate answer. Okay. Let's get a that's real good. answer. Okay. No, no, it's a, it's it's a great valid. answer. Um, I actually want to unpack it twofold because I feel like it's not exactly tightly coupled the, the question. I want to tackle the question about kind of the, uh, the conflicts and also the empathy. Okay. Um, so I've uh, lived through this many times, and many times the person that I was in conflict with would be the CTO and co-founder of the company. And it's like, who am I, little, you know, DevRel or whatever it is, um, trying to bring a position versus somebody that's very powerful in the company. Mm. Uh, and you have to be able to um, find even like a compromise or a way for both sides to be satisfied, satisfied. So if you have differences of opinion for how to, for example, do a certain thing, um, sometimes I would say, okay, let's try both in a limited scope and measure. Let's see which one performs better. What is A, the B better? Testing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What is the better approach? Which community is more excited? Which uh, um, which uh, way we you know which examples are, are better for the community, etc. And if you do that and you kind of find that way to work with the person that's uh, that's creating the conflict, sometimes you'll actually get them a lot more excited about like kind of when they see that something is delivering better and they'll get behind it and then you have all of their engines behind whatever it is that your idea was or you'll actually uh, stand corrected and you'll be like, oh, I was wrong, you're right, okay, that is the better approach and let's do it that way and you'll put all your engines behind them. But if you work together with somebody, it's a much easier way to unpack kind of the, the friction and, get, uh, and work together and, and find something that works for the company, which is the end goal for everyone. Uh, but on the side of the empathy is one of the things that I do want to say in that respect is that oftentimes what's very much overlooked in the world of developer relations and developer experience advocacy um, is actually bringing that feedback back into the organization and that empathy of the user and the end user. A lot of times, a lot of strategic initiatives that the CTO will tell you they need to, that you need to do um, is, not is not tightly coupled with what the community needs or um, it doesn't come from kind of the community feedback and the empathy with the user. It's some kind of strategic initiative with some company that they think is high value, or um, you'll get all kinds of like these strategic initiatives that take engineering resources or other resources that you don't really understand how it brings value to the end user, but you need to be that voice for that end user. And you have to say, well, the end user is experiencing difficulty on this, this, and this platform, doesn't have enough examples uh, to get started with this, or getting user guide is not, you know, getting started guide is not great. And you have to be that voice for the end user and, and create that empathy within the organization so that they know who is who they're you know delivering value to and who is actually the person that they need to be thinking about when they're building their product like that and on, to, on the first side with the conflict resolution is that if you're getting resistance it means someone is passionate and energetic about something how can you channel that into a different direction and also with what kim said get the buy-in you know if it's if it feels like it's just coming from one direction it, the you know the ability for it to be sustainable is going to be limited i think a big part about you know with communities is that if it's just one person doing all the heavy lifting and building, then you know it's gonna get you're gonna get burned out. We'll probably talk about that later. As much as possible, getting as many folks in there as you can. Going back to the side of conflict resolution as well as it A B testing, but also thinking about what are their objectives. You know, like if, if they're going to, you know, the board or investors, you know, what are the metrics and goals that they have? You know, and so in order how can we get everyone to be rowing in the same direction? So um, Lisa? Can I, um, uh, those are those were all kind of corporate answers, and if I think I understand the nature of did that question come from Twitter, the one of the I think that the user may have been asking about community. No, no, that, and that's what no, no, it didn't come from Twitter. Oh, okay. It came from me, and okay. but but they, they answered in on that side, and then you can answer it more from sure. the internal community. I yeah. think a lot of people here run user groups or have run user groups and um, or run communities where the community is external. It might be online, it might be meetups that people are coming to, and when you have. Um, a situation in that kind of environment is very different than um, what my colleagues described of you know your job and you're trying to get stuff done within your corporation and it's really really difficult because we are 
we are empaths, all of us. We are building community, inclusive communities, and there will be conflict. And as you mentioned, sometimes it's not, it's English is not your first language and you're writing in English and something comes across wrong. Sometimes it is just flat out inappropriate because online communities, this even happens more because there doesn't seem, you know, accountability, like no one's, you're not looking someone in the eye when you're saying this. So it's easier to, to say inappropriate things or to say things in just an inappropriate way. And then there's just also flat out harassment. Um, so you have that, and, and we've all, like show of hands, who, who runs a meetup group? Yeah, uh, keep your hand up if you've had a conflict in your meetup group that you've had to do, yep. So like no one put their hand up. So we've all had to deal with a very uncomfortable situation. And you, you don't wanna lose any member of the community. Like this pains me when I've had to do this. It is the most painful part. It's kind of like if you're a manager and you have to let someone go. Like it's the worst part of the job. But you have to do, you, you can't let things happen because you have to keep your entire community together. You know, sometimes you have to make an example out of something or someone for the better of the entire community. So you, and if you have a, a Slack community and you know, someone says something, and a lot of times it's targeted at you as the community manager, and more often than not me, in our corporate Slack channel from the community, and it's, I always wanna give people the benefit of the doubt, and I always wanna just DM them and say, I don't think you meant to say that, or that you might not realize how inappropriate that is. But then my other colleagues and coworkers in my DevRel team are like, Luis, like, you cannot, like, we have to have a zero tolerance policy. You cannot let that behavior go, you know, like it's just, no, no exceptions. You don't, yeah, yeah, exactly, like one and done. And I'm like, but it wasn't that bad. And then, you know, they were like, what if they had said that to me? I'm like, oh man, I, no way. I would have, they're like, well, why don't you have that same policy towards yourself? So that's the hardest part. And while I will boot someone out of the community who has violated the code of conduct, I will also take the time to try to explain to them so that when they join the next community, they will have a learning from it. Um, and hopefully they will be better and they're not just trying to be a jerk. So there's lots of ways you can handle it. And if you wanna talk about this more, um, you can you know come find me or any of the other, your colleagues that have raised their hands on that one. Um, it's the hardest part of the job, but it's super important. Yeah. Good. Uh, we still have, we need more questions to get Dominique on stage. Oh, we've got a question. Just, um, just before the question, I just wanted to add to the uh, Meetup Toolbox. Um, what I found very helpful is, is learning nonviolent communication. It's, and that usually helps. I do run a Meetup group, but it's not corporate. It's, it's on my free time. So. But the question I have comes to the tool. When we started user groups with OpenStack, we all used Meetup. Is that still the tool to use? Is, um, do we have something better that's not meetup.com? Uh, yeah, so I know the CNCF moved everybody over to Bevy. Uh, there's pluses and minuses to everything, but what we ended up having to do is do both. We have never been able to get away from meetup.com to uh, answer your question um, in the US. I, I don't know about other parts of the world. Um, Bevy hasn't really worked. There's been other tools that people have tried to develop themselves. We're still on meetup.com. And, and so we have to have our own YouTube channel where we post everything after. We have to have, like you have to have your yes and. Um, and by the way, what Chris was just talking about, nonviolent communication, is sometimes in the United States called compassionate communication. Uh, there's a lot of books out uh, about it. I can give you some examples. It's an amazing tool if you can, if you can learn it. Um, sometimes when you hear nonviolent communication, you think, no, I didn't punch anyone in the face. But you know, a compassionate <laughs> communication, empathetic communication, you know, question-driven learning, listening, all of these kind of fall in the same bucket. I mean. Oh. I, I'd just like to add to the meetup.com is that what I've found, and I run a lot of my communities on meetup and uh, other places, but um, I have to be everywhere. I have a million different channels because everybody consumes something else and it is what it is. So there's a newsletter, there's the meetup, there's a telegram, there's a WhatsApp now, uh, there's a Discord. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's kind of trying to be uh, everywhere all at once because everybody consumes kind of their uh, knowledge from a different place and knowing that things are happening. and. That's the hard part. That's the chop wood and carry water of community where you want to try and tap into where everybody is. We use Meetup just kind of as a place to have, you know, a banner of that this event is happening. But yeah, we do communicate it out and broadcast it out across many, many, many different channels. If 
you need somebody's real name because now you know, after COVID, nobody lets you in their building without showing your ID and your vaccination status and all of that. You have to use a Google form because meetup.com, you can have any name you want, right? So you have no idea. People show up and they're just like one initial or a picture of their dog, you know? So you really have to actually have a second thing. And don't forget about Twitter, right? Like you need to socialize it out afterwards. Yep. You're done? Thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of like also add a little uh, remark. You have um, open in the open source communities conflict resolution workshops that are very valuable, even though we've done this type of work for a very, very long time. Um, so that's a good tip. I did it recently. It's it's really helpful. Um, I had a question on how you handle it within your communities. If, for example, somebody's been asked not removed from leadership positions or not to attend certain events, how you handle it when other people in your communities set up events. Like, how do how how do you communicate that to people that are organizing your events that some people aren't allowed, for example, to be there? If they if, if somebody has infringed the code of conduct yeah, and they have been removed. Uh, removed from the community, um, so that has happened in our community. Uh, first of all, um, we have some practitioner kind of like groups. Like we have a DevRel IL group, which is like a lot of the DevRels in, in our local community. And when somebody was um, being um, uh, really like inappropriate at, at a few meetups, uh, it was communicated out and people gave a notice that this person is not somebody that you want to lend into your events. Be, be aware, this is the name and be aware of it. And so like a lot of practitioners share knowledge in that respect and you should have, um, I would recommend having like kind of a group of peers that you can tap into and, and share that kind of knowledge uh, across the board, especially if somebody is being violent or compl very inappropriate um, so that, you know, obviously you want to keep your community safe. Um, but, but that said, uh, obviously you can only control your, your own community. You can't control other communities. And so you can only share the knowledge that you have and hope that people um, will, you know, use that. I just, just be super careful with that though, because we don't really get to be the judge of, and it, sometimes it's one person's opinion against another. And we've, I mean, we've had CNCF ambassadors kicked out of the community and it, it's silent, right? They don't say anything about it. And people have asked that question and I'm like, no, I actually think that's the right thing because it's one person's opinion against somebody else's. And maybe they did learn from that situation and maybe they're a really valuable member of the community and they can be valuable again not in that community because zero tolerance, but we, we don't want to just say you're done for the rest of your life, right? We want to give people a chance to learn and grow and hopefully they will, right? So it depends on how bad the thing was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so Love Sector is a corporate uh, view and uh, in regards to the um, metrics for the community of practice, you said um, value is the most important. And my question is basically how, how can I really some, in some way prove that it happens, that, that value is being created. Because, yeah, I know developer A is, has been working for something on weeks or months, and developer B is just taking this and, and saving the company like a half a year or whatever. And how can you prove that? It's, it's massive value, but um, it's nowhere to be documented. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this real quick. And, and this is something that we can probably continue and, and talk about like forever on metrics, right? So um, it, there's so many books on metrics, uh, Jono's, Mary's. I mean, you can read these books and get ideas on how, how you want to track the effectiveness of your community. There's great information out on um, opensource.com as well. And then, of course, the chaos group, right? Uh, they're part of the Linux Foundation, and they do a lot of work on metrics. So um, it's, uh, and to summarize, and so we get to the next question, is that it comes back to what your, what your goal of your organization is. And I came up with metrics, and I'll be, happy, I'll be happy to share them with everybody. I'll throw them in a blog. But I came up with some that's going to show progress in our community based on where we are right now, right? And where we are right now is aware, I need awareness and growth. So um, I'll be happy to show, and I, I think we can continue this conversation because we could go forever. So great question. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, and actually you as well, Bart, um, what do you each see as the biggest blind spot that most communities have? Like what should communities be doing that they're not doing right now? So from there, there's two sides to that question. So one of the biggest blind spots, and that's, this is one of 
one of the things that I often tell companies when they ask me, like, oh, I, we need to build a community, we need to build a product, product community, we need to build the amount of work. So first of all, be very, very cognizant of the amount of work that goes into building a community. It doesn't like flourish overnight. The numbers that I've seen uh, companies uh, say they want to grow their communities to an, a certain amount of time, just like, oh, that's science fiction. Um, so. You know what I mean? So that's one thing that you need to communicate very, very well. And the other half of it is fostering new voices. You often see these communities where you see the same people over and over again talking about the same things. And um, that's the area that I think that as, you know, when I was talking about like kind of the privilege of our community being strong and big and, and well-funded at this point, we do put a lot of resources into helping people craft good CFPs and, and mentoring speakers and other things to enable other folks to get more meaningfully involved. And um, even through like the work in the community. So um, some people want to be start getting involved in being organizers or being on the team or whatever, and they don't even know where to get started. And so we say to them, come, be a volunteer on the day of the event, see if it, it's exciting to you, if you uh, feel like you want to contribute more, if you want to do more. Uh, and you enable kind of that on-ramp that we were talking about actually in the podcast and make it really, really easy. What you call mean time to a low world for contributing codes, a mean time to community, enabling them to have a really easy on-ramp into your community and, um, and get involved. I did actually want to answer your question Go very, quickly. very briefly, Go quickly. On, the quickly. on the engineering uh, part. So oftentimes this is a dev developer advocate's job, right? Sometimes a developer advocate has a theory about something that can benefit the client or the user and, and wants to kind of change the way that something is architected or built or some kind of feature that needs to be created and they don't know how to prove that, it's really, that it really brings value. And this is where user zero and design partner zero become really, really important. You can demonstrate it by actually dog fooding a lot of the things that you create and then the people that are actually using this new engineering feature see the value of it. Um, but other also, you can also kind of test it with those design partner zeros. You can say, okay, I'm rolling this out in a very kind of controlled way to certain users that are high value to us and they'll tell us if the experience with this uh, feature is better when it's written like this or like this and then you can actually bring the value to the users and, and the management. Okay. Yeah, Go and um, find out what tool that your community, that your, that your company is using to measure. It could be Common Room, it could be Orbit. Newsflash, it's salesforce.com in most places. Get, find, an, find a salesperson who has access to salesforce.com. If you spoke at a conference, add your name to that conference. If, you, if somebody tweeted out about a, an amazing thing of code or you, know, you solved a GitHub issue, whatever it is that you can attach your name to, to that customer, get that documented in salesforce.com, just pro tip. Um, to answer Jana's question, burnout. I mean, something you've helped me with a lot. We talk about it a lot, mental health, and yet it's still, in my opinion, one of the biggest blind spots. So hit me up afterwards, we can talk more about that, and thank you for helping me <laughs> through a lot of that stuff. Good. Kim? Oh, me. Um, well, we're done. I thought I was getting out of answering the question. The biggest <laughs> blind spot. Um, uh, boy, I don't know. I think you two. That's okay. We can. I don't really. We can continue. Well, no, no. But we, he just told me we have to stop. So yeah, to, to, to be stop, continued. Uh, no, no. I, one, one thing that I would say, I agree both on the mental health part as well as what Sharon said. The amount of work that it takes, these things don't just fall from yeah. the sky. And you know, getting getting those first thousand users or, or you know hitting those initial metrics is really hard and a lot of trial and error, and, and that's where the burnout can come in. I would say one thing that I that I that I definitely got wrong was not doing. Uh, qualitative analysis and not just quantitative in the sense of um, you know jobs to be done interviews of I go out and talk to different community members who are at different levels and different profiles to get direct feedback from them about how I'm doing um, that that's something that I think all community members should be should be doing as a way of uh, alleviating the stress of only looking at numbers go out and talk to your community members and that's that's a way of building champions ambassador programs things of that nature um, so that's what I would add that being said Thank you very much. Wonderful questions. Great panel. Give yourselves a hand. You rock. Really, really good. As mentioned in the beginning, um, we will have the podcast um, coming out um, in about a month, and we will have further conversations about this. We're really easy to find. Um, hit us up on Twitter, Slack, etc. Keep being wonderful people. Stay hydrated and enjoy the rest of KubeCon. Cheers.